Welcome, my friends, to Inside the Minds of Authors. I'm DC Gomez, and I'm thrilled you're joining me today for a fun conversation with a passionate author. We're kicking off the program like it's our tradition with a short reading from the future book. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let's get started. I am Mr. Eric Walker, and I am an Ohio author, first-time author. My debut novel, Lost Souls Recovered, is a historical fiction book, and it came out on October 18th, this past October, so I'm excited to be here. Again, it's my first book, and I am working on a second book as well. I'm going to read a few paragraphs from the first chapter so you have some idea as to what the book is about, and it is set in Richmond, Virginia in 1887. So this is early post-Reconstruction American South, again, in Richmond, Virginia. And so this is from chapter one of my book, and here it goes. Even with the war a little more than two decades in the past, John was a virtual slave chained to the people who'd once legally owned his mother. At 17, and his youth pulling him, at him to go to explore to find a woman, he hankered to break the chain and go elsewhere, anywhere that wasn't Richmond, but thoughts of leaving his saintly mother kept the chain in place. His mother would die of a broken heart if he told her about what Madame Laura Billingsley had made him do a few years back. Laura had figured he wouldn't tell a soul, surely not his mother and certainly not Monsieur Tyrone Billingsley. Laura had been right. He hated the suffocating mental cage Madame Billingsley caused him to live in. She had taken away his freedom to even tell a secret to his mother. As much as he wanted to mute the voices in his head telling him to kill Madame Billingsley, the voices lingered. He stood one spring evening in the butler's pantry and poured its sherry into two teardrop sherry glasses as he had done so many times. He could pour exactly three ounces of sherry into each glass with his eyes closed without spilling a drop. John was a lean, five foot, 11 inches tall. He had short, wavy, raven black hair, russet covered tinted eyes, a mahogany colored face, full lips, and a slightly bent nose that sat atop a strong jaw. Tyrone Billingsley demanded that John be turned out in fine clothes when he worked in the house or when he took Billingsley to town. So this evening, he wore the usual attire, a white shirt, with a stamping collar, a black vest that closed almost at the throat, thereby almost covering his tie, a short black waist jacket that exposed his shirt cuffs, black breeches, and black laced shoes. It was almost dinner time at the Billingsley's Mansion, also known as Billingsley. Torrential rain had enveloped Richmond for five consecutive days. The crop fields cleared by former slave labor had turned into bogs. Laura stood in front of the oversized Rondo dining room window, her right hand pressed against it. She had felt the window vibrate as the hail and rain pelted it. She looked at the laden sky and wondered if the window and all the windows in her mansion would protect her and her expensive furnishings from the relentless barrage of water sent from above. She saw in the reflection when Tyrone sat at the dining table, then she drew the heavy, ornate blue velvet curtains and joined him at the other end, just the two of them. The Billingsley estate was large, both the house and the 300 acres surrounding land. The house was an 8,000 square foot, 25 room Greek revival house characterized by durian pillars that wrapped around it. Intricate wrought iron gates connected the pillars on the second floor portico. The long entranceway leading to the front of Billingsley was adorned with live oak trees and was, were arranged symmetrically on each side. Sprawling gardens and landscaping contained 24 flower beds and 20 different kinds of trees. Seemingly endless walkways formed a maze. A heavily adorned pergola stood at the rear of the massive botanical garden. Laura had been known to lose herself in the gardens after an argument with her husband. When the last of the Billingsley children had moved out several years ago, Tyrone Billingsley had decided to reduce his kitchen staff, expecting that he and Laura could get by with one cook. Laura had protested, believing that her society friends 
would whisper that something was wrong with the Billingsleys, that they were depleting their money. Tyrone had won that battle, but Laura knew when to keep her powder dry and when to strike with a full frontal assault. Her husband had felt it many times, as had Sam, John, Anne, and anyone else in her line of fire. Sam, the Billingsley's longtime cook, had prepared one of Laura's favorite dishes for the evening, lobster cutlet, a pastry shell filled with a temple of black grouse and a chestnut puree, spring lamb, and Johnny cake. The Billingsley's often had a bracer for, before their meal. Today was no different. The sherry aperitif would be served at 6.30, as was their custom when Tyrone was in town and maraschino cherry sorbet would be served at the end of the meal to refresh the palate. John's stomach gurgled and his hands felt heavy as he prepared to serve dinner to the Billingsleys. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath to exercise all images of what Laura had done to him a few years ago and to slow his heart rate as much as he could. He stood at Red Rock straight, picked up the salver that held the Billingsley sherry aperitif and walked gingerly into the dining room. He surveyed the dining table set up, hoping, praying that he had set the table pieces to Madam Billsley's satisfaction. She was persnickety and the icy matron of the house. Everything was in place and John's heartbeat returned to its normal rhythm. A thunderclap startled him, causing him to stop at his tracks. Horrible images of Laura resurfaced. His heartbeat quickened again and his mouth went dry, anticipating some kind of rebuke from his perfect table set up notwithstanding. A corner of the ornate Persian rug on which the dining table sat was curled up. John had failed to notice it. A trip and spilled the drink on the ice cream. She shot him a three-second bottleless stare and screamed, you stupid idiot. As she used her white monogrammed linen napkin in an effort to dry the amber stain from the lace on her pink satin polonaise, John said, I'm sorry, Madam Billingsley. She raised her head from her dress and John suffered through the same stare that could stop a charging bull in his tracks. He thought he had gotten used to Madam Billingsley's ugliness, but this time they stung hard, penetrating the fortress he had erected around himself to deflect the full soleil of contemptuous sniping. She had managed, though, to intensify his hatred for her. everyone and welcome to Inside the Minds of Authors. I'm excited to have the amazing Mr. Eric. Love this reading and we're going to jump in. Hi, how are you today, darling? I am doing just fine. Happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I am glad you're here. Welcome, welcome to the show. Let's jump in. I want to know this is your first book. Congratulations on it. Let's talk about inspiration. Where did this book come from? What made you decide to do it? I decided to do this book because I was inspired after doing a bunch of genealogical research. I'm somewhat of the family historian, and years ago, many years ago, decades ago, I would say, I was on Ancestry and finding out more about my relatives through historical documents, such as census records, birth certificates, death certificates, and on and on and on. And I wanted to bring this story alive in some way, and what really impelled me to write the book was talking to one relative in particular who had told me about her grandfather, therefore my great-great-grandfather, about how he had lived as a young Negro boy in Richmond, Virginia. And it was a very faint story, a very vague story, but it was something that I took that kernel and ran with. But what she had told me was that the protagonist, the main character in the book, John Billingsley, is Billingsley is a slave name. He later changed his name to Davis which is in my family, the Davis name, after he reached his destination. But she had told me that John, the 17-year-old Negro boy in Richmond, Virginia, was working on a slave plantation, but of course, slavery had ended by that time. But he had gotten into some type of disagreement or argument with the mistress of the house, that's what they called them at that time, or the wife of the former slave plantation owner, and he had to leave town. He had to skedaddle, so to speak, to get out of Richmond. In the process of doing that, this relative reported to me from her recollection of what her grandfather had told her, that he pushed her down and ran. And in the process of escaping, he had, of course, quote unquote, assaulted this white woman. So he needed to leave. In the process of escaping, he left and he found a friend to go with. And on his journey south, he was able to survive by eating off the land, for instance, on the melons, as she would say, and potatoes, 
And so that sketchy provisions or evidence that she provided me was enough to inspire me to write this story, which I had always wanted to do. I just didn't know the framework of it until she explained to me what had happened. You made a historical fiction novel. You have family pieces that you added into this. How much research did you have to do to bring this book to life? Oh, with any historical fiction book, especially I'm going back to the early post-Reconstruction period, there was a ton of research. And if you just heard me reading some from the first chapter, I would have to go to the digital libraries and just research online about the type of clothing that they would wear, the type of food that they would consume. So I want to make sure that was authentic in the way that I presented my book to the reader. In addition to that, there are two main events that happened in the book, well, several main events, actually, but one was called Tredgar Ironworks. Tredgar Ironworks is a a Scottish-owned factory, iron factory, I believe, that helped the Confederacy with weapons during the Civil War. And Tyrone Billingsley, you heard me refer to him as Monsieur Billingsley, that was the name that John Billingsley gave him, Monsieur Billingsley, because John, the young Negro boy, learned to speak some French from being a house servant with the Billingsleys. So Tyrone Billingsley, had a contract of sorts with Treadgar Ironworks and actually went to Richmond, Virginia, where remnants of the Treadgar Museum, the Civil War Museum is what they call it, but the Treadgar Iron Factory, the remnants of that still exist. So I went there and did some research to learn more about Treadgar. In addition, one other event in the book is called Sloss Furnace, which is in Birmingham, Alabama. And there's a large scene in my book about Sloss Furnace. And I was able to go there as well, just to kind of visualize what it was like so I can make it more authentic or appear more authentic to the reader. That is really impressive because you're looking at pulling a lot of the modern day information you have to bring into this book. As you were pulling all these things together, did you have a person in mind or a character in mind that you said, I would like to add these qualities into the book? Well, when I was writing the scene about Tredgar, and that takes up probably the first seven or eight chapters uh, of the book, I wanted to invent Tyrone Billingsley, which is a total invention because with historical fiction, as you know, there was a melding of both true events and true characters with both fictional events and fictional characters. So I wanted to present or develop this Tyrone Billingsley, a more strong Tyrone Billingsley, as someone who was a wealthy man, which he was. I pictured Tyrone Billingsley being this upright guy, paternalistic slave owner back in the day. And I thought he would fit nicely with the fact that he was doing business with Tredgar. So I kind of envisioned him being a wealthy man and making his own money by doing business with Tredgar Ironworks, as an example. Oh, I like the pieces that you're bringing into the equation. Is this going to be a standalone or are you looking into making this a series? What is the essence of this book? Excellent question. I certainly appreciate the question. So the book Lost Souls Recovery, I had started out being a standalone book. But then it's been reviewed by several professional reviewers, Kirkus as an example, Book Viral and others, and it's gotten very good reviews. And some other reviewers have said that they would like to see me expand on the story about Laura Billingsley, who's quite evil. And if you read more of the book or read the book, you will see what she actually does to John, which is pretty horrible. But they're asking me to develop her. In my view, she's quite developed in the book, but people would like to see a spinoff of her as an example, or even John's mother. I would say it's really a standalone book. But this is what I really like about it, because I am working on my second book. In Lost Souls Recovered, there is a scene where one of the relatives, my relatives, that goes back to the mid-1880s, his land is stolen by a white land owner, for instance. So in my second book, which I'm calling tentatively titled In the Belly of the Beast, and it just takes a snapshot from Lost Souls Recovered, and I'm making this new book, is where in present day time, uh, 2023 or 2024, whenever it comes out, this young man who wants to go to medical school, but he's taking time off to try to redeem the land that was stolen from his ancestors over 140 years ago. So yes, it's standalone, but I am taking a scene, actually just a paragraph or two, of Lost Souls Recovered and running with that as I write my second book, In the Belly of the Beast. I like that you're kind of pulling from the same universe you've already been dealing with and creating the next book. So that's really fun. So people can read them together. They can read them separate. They still have an amazing story. Do you have a target audience that you would like for this book to reach? For Lost Souls Recovered, it's, as an example, it's in lots of libraries. I live in Ohio and it's in bookstores, but it's people who just love history. If you want a different take on my take, as an example, as to what was going on, early post-reconstruction period, 
I think that would be a perfect audience for it. But more importantly, though, if anyone has written historical fiction or any kind of novel, actually, the promise to the reader that I tried to make, and I hope I did, and I told I did make this promise and it was fulfilled, is the book is entertaining. It, I think it's a page turner, and you're going to want to keep reading to the end to find out what happened. So, yes, that's my audience there. To, it's, if you like a good book, I think you'll enjoy Lost Souls Recovered. Because a number of people have said that they typically don't read historical fiction and they were glad that they read this one in particular. Oh, that's such a great compliment. Especially if you're reading outside of your genre, you get to explore something totally new. So that's very exciting. Do you have an author that has inspired you or that has motivated you to start writing? Well, yeah. So when I started writing my book many years ago, I didn't know anything about historical fiction. So the internet wasn't what it is today. And I just started doing the basic research is what kind of book would I like to write? And I had read like Cane River and Red River by Lolita Tatami as an example. That was instructive to me. And John Jakes was one of my favorites. So because they were writing about either Civil War or post-Civil War or early Reconstruction or post-Reconstruction. So I those two authors in, in particular were important to me as I began to write my book. You get to pull from many different places to get inspiration and hopefully the motivation. Speaking of inspiration, your next book that you're pulling from, where did the inspiration for that one come? I got that you pull a piece from this one. Where does the rest of the story come from? Well, you're asking a great question. If the audience may remember, and I think it's about been about a year ago or so, more than a year, I think, there was a law that was passed in California, whereby the state of California decided to award money or give money as part of a lawsuit, as part of a settlement, to the Bruce Beach's family. In 1912, Bruce Beach and his wife, they had developed this beach property, and it was later taken from them under the umbrella of eminent domain by the city. I think it was the city of Manhattan at that time in California. But it was taken from them for a pittance. And later, maybe, like I said, a year or so ago, the state of California voted through a general assembly and the governor Newsom said, hey, this is your land. It was wrongfully taken from you and we're going to give it back to you. So that's governmental action. In my book, though, this land was taken privately by the white land owner whose name is Cecil Thornsbury, as an example. And so in current day time, like when the book comes out, 23 or 24, it will show that although the government is not involved because the government didn't take the property from my family, it was a private land on a private person. He's going to try to go in the belly of the beast because real quick here, the person who owned that land in 1887, he stole it from my great grandfather. He then put a dry goods store on that land in 1888. That dry goods store in, in Lawrence County, Alabama, that dry goods store developed in present day to time, as I would tell them in the book, into a conglomerate grocery store chain of 340 stores. So how is he going to get land back that 140 years later, well, he's going to buy himself, actually with an accomplice, try to take down this big conglomerate with he and a 19-year-old woman. So that's what my second book is about. I like the spin you're taking on it and kind of really pointing out some huge pieces. How are you going to do it? Because you're not only trying to say, I need my land back, but now I'm going to take on a big corporation. So that's pretty impressive. That's a lot of research. Very, very exciting. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. So tell me, dear, as you've been tackling the writing world and creating these stories, what is one lesson you have learned that you're like, oh, didn't know that when I started? Oh, <laughs> wow. The, how much research is involved? You've just got to do the research because I read reviews and I review books myself. And one of the common things I hear about not only historical fiction books, but books in general is the readers will know if you don't do your research and they'll say that doesn't fit. And that's a terrible feeling is if you don't do your research because people will call you off for it. Some may be polite and ignore it, but just the amount of research is just incredible. That's one of the biggest things that I did not know, but now that I'm writing my second book and having experienced my first book, I think I'm much better at it and I know how to do it more efficiently, let's say that. That's always very exciting. Research is one of those things that you can go down that path and go way too far. So I'm glad you, yeah. I'm glad you found a happy path right. in the middle. Where can our viewers find you? Where can they find the book when they can learn more about you? Tell us a little bit about this. Okay, absolutely. I am in Ohio and my book, Lost Souls Recovered, as I said, came out October 18th. 
First place, my book is everywhere online. And my name is Eric Walker, as it says on the book. And if you just Google that, Eric Walker, Lost Souls Recovered, you'll see it available for sale on Amazon, on Barnes & Noble, Book Thrift, and just a ton of online retail stores. I'm in the process of getting it into the actual brick and mortar stores of Barnes & Noble, but I still have some things to do to get that accomplished. But just Google my name, Eric Walker, Lost Souls Recovered. You'll see it there. And if you're in Ohio, check your local library. It's likely there. If not, request it. It's in, it comes in three forms right now, ebook, paperback, and hardback. One of the things real quick that I like about the hardback version is this is the dust jacket. Then you remove the dust jacket, and you have the same illustration on the book itself. So I'm very pleased with the publisher handed the hardcover version of the book. That's very nice for everybody who likes hardback. You need to definitely pick a copy. So, darling, before you leave us, are you ready for the lightning round? Okay, yes, go. <laughs> Easy peasy. Don't think too much about this. Sweet or sour? Oh, sweet. <laughs> nice. I'm telling you, easy peasy. Hiking or camping? I, very easy. Every summer, spring, I go hiking. I'm a big hiker. Just check nice. out my YouTube or my social media. You'll see me hiking all the time. <laughs> Nice. Summer or winter? Well, because I like to go outdoors and explore, get ideas for my book. I, I love summer. Very, very nice. Cats or dogs? Oh, <laughs> sorry for the cat lovers, but dogs by far. <laughs> like, it's okay. Yeah. We will forgive you. Here's a little different one. Let's see how you do with this. If your life was turned into a film, who would you like to play you? Oh, my gosh. Everyone probably will say Will Smith, but I don't know if that is the cool thing to say after that slap. Uh, <laughs> maybe LA Cool J, I'm guessing. <laughs> okay. Sounds like a plan. Awesome. That's a really good one. I'll take it. So okay. tell us, darling, closing remarks fast. Do you have anything you would like to tell us? Well, first of all, yes. I want to thank you for doing what you do by giving authors this platform. I saw this online. I said, I'm going to reach out to DC Gomez, a little bit of research, and I'm so privilege actually to be with you that you are able to share your platform and I would say that if you want to be a writer you just got to be disciplined and consistent I do think my book is a very good one I compare it to the books of those authors who are traditionally published and I said yeah my even though I don't have that big of a distribution to push my book out there like the traditional publishers do I think it's every bit as good as the traditional publishers but I'm getting the word out there because of people like you and for that I'm immensely grateful Absolutely a pleasure and congratulations again. Can't wait to hear about book number two. So definitely let us know. To our listeners, go ahead, pick up this book, check it out. Check out the fabulous Mr. Eric Walker. See what he is all about. You can check him out on social media, find out all the hiking that he's doing. So absolutely. Right. <laughs> and thank right. you so much, my friends, for joining us today. We'll be back next Monday with another amazing author. So if you're interested in supporting the community, Make sure to click the podcast links. And thank you, everyone. Bye, Mr. Eric. Goodbye.